got one final topic to talk about right here. So you are from Memphis, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So yeah, we want. I want to talk about the Memphis Grizzlies. Talk about how their team, you know, has kind of came together this year. You know, actually, scratch that. Before we kind of talk about the Grizzlies as a team, do you think they're going to make the playoffs this year? You know, I know that they're the current AFC right now, but a lot of people are thinking that the Pelicans can overtake them. Some people think that the, think that the Blazers can overtake them. Do you see the Memphis Grizzlies holding on to that AFC as of right now? Uh, without a doubt in my mind, man. And I, I do like that Pelicans team. I think that they have a shot at, at coming back and stripping that from the uh, New Orleans or from Memphis. I just think that the, they have an uphill battle to climb to do so. Versus with Memphis, they kind of stand in the in the control of their own destiny right now. And the team with the edge that they have, I, I I just love the young talent that they've accumulated on that team. John Morant, Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr. Now you throw Justice Winslow into the fold. Kyle Anderson, all of these, uh, Brandon Clark, excuse me, how did I not mention Brandon Clark? Um, so much young talent that already, like I said, knows how to play with one each other, one another. Those teams are going to have the biggest advantage. They don't have an uphill battle to climb. I do think that they hold on to that eighth seed, but I do think that the Pelicans are going to come and challenge them for it. I just think Memphis holds their own. Personally, I think the Pelicans actually make it in as a final playoff team. I know Zion left the NBA bubble um, briefly. I don't know if he came back yet, but yeah, if, if Zion is healthy and you know playing for that team, I, I think the Pelicans actually make it in. Just simply because they have a very easy schedule. But, yeah, I, I'm not going to give you too much pushback as far as picking Memphis because they're a very good team. Um, I do think Portland is an underrated team that could make it in because they're finally healthy. But, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to give you too much pushback for that. So kind of talk about how Memphis, you know, has been, you know, built and just – their overall construction of a team, obviously people talk about Ja Morant. You know, I think Jaron Jackson Jr. and Ja Morant are the most underrated duo in all of basketball. I, I, mo I most recently made an episode talking about them. You know, kind of talk about them as a duo and just how the Memphis Grizzlies have, you know, surprised a lot of people this year because I didn't think they were quite a playoff team this year. But, yeah, what are your thoughts? Memphis, obviously, as you know, uh, they had that whole grit and grind era when we were talking about Mike Conley, Tony Allen, Marcus Saw, Courtney Lee. Um, they, these were Zach Randolph. Uh, these were the guys that were leading the charge for the Memphis Grizzlies. They played a lot. Of, they made a very slow style of basketball. They relied on their two bigs heavily, um, being Zach Randolph and Marcus Saul. And as the NBA evolved, and we saw the research, uh, the emergence of the three point shot and the playing with a lot of space, things of that nature, that got outdated very quickly. And Memphis, they tried to do some things with the three-point shooting. They brought in Chandler Parsons on one of the worst contracts in recent history. That didn't work out. So they really had to throw a monkey wrench on the whole thing and just blow it up and disseminate it and try to rebuild it from the ground up. They did a very good job at doing that because they were able to – and they did get lucky, I'll get to that, but they were able to kind of flip some players, bring in some guys, um, but one of the luckiest parts that they got, they ended up with Jaron Jackson. That was the first real building block that came in that was this eye for the future for Memphis, and Jaron Jackson, he's a guy that a lot of people, they know about how good he is on defense, right? But they he's such a weird player on offense because he has such a reliable three-point shot, but it looks so ugly. It's like a push shot, and I'm like, every time I see it, I cringe a little bit, but it goes in, and he can hit, like, this isn't just a set shot, this isn't just a spot-up thing. The dude's, like, doing between the leg, behind the back, step back, three-pointers, and he'll nail those things with the ugliest-looking jumper, so it's effective. So that was the first cog that came in. Next year, they got extremely lucky, and they got the number two overall pick. They were able to land John Morant, and they also brought in Brandon Clark. So now you have this young core of Brandon Clark, JJJ, John Morant. Those three guys are leading the charge for this team right now. And the beautiful thing about it, man, is that they still have that chip on the shoulder that they identified with during the great grind. Right, they grind out uh, games. They, they play tough defense. They um they they want it more than their opponent. They're willing to fight for it. They have this edge. They have this chip on the shoulder. But they do it in a modern style of basketball. There's a lot more spacing. John Moran is one of the most creative players in the NBA. Um, uh, Eric Mobley, assistant coach for the for USC, um, he told me once. He said basketball is a game of creation and imagination. I don't think anyone in the game right now, maybe Trey Young, but not many players embody that 
more than, than John Morant. Just go watch some highlights, man. It's absolutely ridiculous just some of the things that he thinks of on the court. So they have this, this level of m- modern style to their play, but it's also rooted in this great and grind mentality, which is so beautiful to me because they, it allows the city to still identify with the team and identify with that history while still progressing to this modern era of basketball. So it's really a sight to behold, man. I have a lot of love for that team. I'm a Lakers fan through and through, but I've been to way too many Grizzlies games to not have some semblance of support for that team. John Morant's probably my favorite player in the NBA right now. I'm rooting for them all the way. It just sucks that the Lakers are going to have to knock them out in the first round in four games. Interesting, interesting. So you've obviously been to some Grizzlies games, you said. So talk about your most memorable Memphis Grizzly game. You can give me about one or two games if you want, if you have a hard time choosing. All right. So the most memorable ones for me uh, were more from a fan experience standpoint than a uh, like gameplay standpoint because I've been to a lot of really good basketball games. So some of them, they, they slipped through the head. I actually had season tickets. Um, but – the first one, it was my birthday, and I was able to go with a lot of my friends, and uh, we were actually able to swing a picture with Mike Conley, which is very cool. Mike Conley, obviously, we all know is one of the best guys in the NBA. Friendly dude, so down to earth, so humble. He took the time out to talk to us, um, got a picture with us. That very much shout out to him for that. That was such a fun time, and we got to see Memphis go go handle some business. I think it was the Jazz that were playing that night. Ironically, since Mike Conley's on the Jazz now. Um, but that was a very fun game. And then the second most fun game, man, I gotta say it was when Chris Paul was still on the Clippers and I swear to you, Chris Paul was making fun of me because my, my seats were pretty close to, they were right behind the, um, the away bench. So we always got to see the away team. And I swear to you, I was sitting next to my friend, uh, and I swear to you, Chris Paul was making fun of me. I don't know why. I don't know what he was saying, but I could. I just remember pointing out to my friend. I'm like, "Yo, is Chris Paul looking at me right now?" And I'm like, looking at Chris Paul. Like, are you looking at me? And he kind of gives me a look back, and I'm like, "There's no way." Well, why would you be looking at me? And then Chris Paul like taps one of his teammates. I forget who it was, but he taps his teammate. He points directly at me. He whispers something to him, and then they start laughing. And I'm like, "Yo, are, are these guys checking me right now? <laughs> like, am I getting made fun of for what? Like, what, what, what's wrong with these dudes?" So I, I I'll never forget that moment because I was like. Why is Chris Paul looking at me right now? I'm like looking at him. Do I have a mustard stain on my face or something? What, what was going on? But I maybe I yeah, my friend saw it too. He swears that Chris Paul was looking at me. So I don't know, man. I might have some. I, I might have a bone to pick with Chris Paul for that one of these days. I have to figure out what the issue was. But um, those are the two most memorable times that I had at Grizzlies game. Obviously, there's some games here and there. I remember they upset the Golden State Warriors. That was a fun game to be at. But I was. I never got the chance to go to. Would you believe that the year that I leave to go to California, that's the year that John Morant comes in. So I don't get to see any of the crazy stuff that he does. So it is what it is. But those are some of the more fun experiences that I had at Grizzlies games. Very fun games to go to. That Chris Paul story is pretty funny right there, I will say. That that's some funny stuff. Now, let's talk about the let's talk about the Grizzlies front office a little bit right here because you know, Memphis is is a well-run organization, I think. You know, they've done a great job of drafting players and building up this very good young team. However, Memphis is sort of more of a small market. And we kind of talked about how earlier with Giannis, how he's in Milwaukee. It's not a free agent destination. So you, have, you either have to draft players very well or go out and maybe trade for some players because you're not going to get a whole lot of free agents. Now, maybe the flash and, and glamour of John Morant can maybe attract some other free agents to come to Memphis. But I just don't quite see it, man. So as far as Memphis goes, you know, do you have a little bit of a concern about their long-term success due to the fact that they have to draft players and that free agents don't necessarily go there? I know I know that they can draft very well, but this upcoming draft is not particularly a strong draft, I would say. And the NBA is really not like the NFL. You know, in the NFL, you can find a fourth or fifth round pick that might be a gym, a dog. I mean, Tom Brady was like a fifth or sixth round pick. For crying out loud, okay? So, yeah. Um, kind of talk about how that might be a concern. Is that is that a fair assessment or a concern for the Grizzlies' future? So, the, the beautiful thing that they've been able to do is draft players that fit the organizational identity very well. Um, prime example being John Morant. The year that they, they slipped to second in the lottery, or they, they rose to second in the lottery, that was one of the crazier lotteries in recent memory because that was all out of whack. 
Um, but I remember thinking when it was between the Pelicans and the Grizzlies for the number one pick, I remember in the back of my hand or the back of my mind, I'm like, it'd be really cool to have Zion in Memphis. But Zion is, he doesn't embody the city and the team like you'd want him to, right? Zion is this six foot seven, six foot eight, 280 pound behemoth of a person. He's not an underdog. Right, at, I mean, not at this point in his career, the dude's not the guy that you would look at. He's like, okay, that's the guy that you know people doubt him. No one's doubting Zion. No one doubts his ability. If anything, they just doubt his ability to stay healthy. John Moran is a little bit different. He's a dude that didn't have any offers except for Murray State coming out of high school. Everybody knows the story of the dude going to go get some chips. He happens to discover John Moran in the back gym because John didn't get this, or John didn't get selected for one of the better players of the camp. So he's having to go play by himself in the back gym. He gets his offer to Murray State there. Murray State, obviously not one of the, the upper echelon uh, basketball schools in the country. He carries that team to a, um, a March Madness, and then he actually gives them a little bit of a Cinderella run for a while, taking down some teams that, that, that were ranked higher. Um, and then he comes to Memphis. So John Morant is a dude that he doesn't need all the flash and glamour to be happy. And I think he's a guy that will stick around for the long call. Same with Jaron Jackson Jr. I see similar traits in him. I see similar traits in Brandon Clark. When you talk about the upper echelon of NBA stars, I've heard things floated around about a potential shooting for Bradley Beal. I'm not sure that they need it, man. I think I'd be willing to ride with this young core that they have right now. I very much like Justice Winslow's game. I think that he, he definitely can have a spot here long term. I think there's a lot of guys here who can develop into very, very strong role players. I mean, I didn't even mention DeAnthony Melton, Tyus Jones. Those guys can develop into very strong role players. So I think you stick with the core that you have now. Um, and, 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 you know, they, they're all on a level to where you can, you should be able to secure all of them long-term contracts because they're not all, you know, all of these dudes that are going to command high deals. I say you ride it out with the dudes that you have now. I think that team could be a competitor some years down the line. Obviously not now, but, you know, the fact that they made the eighth seed tells you a lot about how good this team can be and predicts to be down the line. So I say you stick it out with the, the, with the dudes you have now. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's a fair assessment. And by the way, as far as Bradley Beal goes, I need him on my Brooklyn Nets. Like Kevin Durant, Kyrie, and Bradley Beal. Ooh, you don't need it. That that'd you be deadly, no doubt. I, I want I, that to happen. I, I need him on the Lakers. You need him on the Lakers. I need him on the Lakers. I don't know how. I don't know how how we could possibly make that work financially. But you know what? At this point, what even is a salary cap? I need him on the. You, you, we need him way more than y'all need. Y'all already have Dinwiddie. You already have Tory and Prince. You you got players, man. We we need that we need that third dude. I will say Bradley Beal is the legit ideal LeBron James teammate. A guy that's a grown up, a grinder. You know, he's a guy that does not miss games. You know, and he's a great pick and pop shooter. You know, LeBron James loves his shooters, and Bradley Beal, man, with his ability to you know score the basketball with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And keep in mind, LeBron James is getting a little bit older in age. So, I mean, it would be a little bit more ideal to get more more help for him eventually down the road. But, yeah, I mean, Bradley Beal and the Lakers, that'd be crazy. Don't know if they can make it work financially, like you said, though. But, man, um, it's been a pretty good show, man, so far. Um, anything else you really want to say um, or plug in? Uh, no, nah, not on my end, man. I just want to tell your viewers to keep to keeping up with you, man. Yeah, you're doing a lot of great stuff, and you're, you're really – uh, one of the better underground people doing this. I know you produce all your stuff by yourself, and I know how tough that can get, man. So, you know, all y'all that support this guy, all y'all that support the Juice Alert, continue to do so, man. This dude does some really great stuff, and he does it at a high level for someone, you know, that doesn't might not have the resources of, of you know, some of the bigger people in this industry. So, you know, hats off to you for what you do, man. Yep, no excuses on this side. I'll make it work, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, I appreciate you, Reagan, for coming on the show, man. It was great. No doubt, man. Anytime, anytime. Thank you so much for watching this video today. Please also note that the Juice Alert Sports Podcast is not just a YouTube channel. It is available on all podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this content with all your friends. This podcast is my favorite thing in the entire world right now. It is my passion. I want more people to listen to this podcast. I really want this podcast to grow. Also, a fun fact about me is that I want to go into the sports broadcasting and media world once I graduate from the University of Toledo, a college in Northern Ohio. I currently am a freshman there right now.
I am looking to become one of the next great sports broadcasters and analysts out in the world. And I potentially would like to start my own network if this podcast really truly grows. Or if I fall short of that goal, I would love to work for a big time network like ESPN or Fox Sports 1. I am open to all networks. So if you believe in my dreams and you see or hear my passion through the screen, be sure to tell all your friends about the Juice Alert Sports Podcast. Stay motivated, you guys. Have a God-blessed day, and I'm out.